Welcome to the FAA Production Studios and the FAA Safety Team National Resource Center located right here at the Sun and Fun Complex in Lakeland, Florida. I'm your host, Walt Schammel, and our next presenter is a commercial pilot, holds a flight instructor certificate, been flying over 17 years, and is currently the manager of the safety education with the AOPA Air Safety Foundation. Her topic is Mastering Takeoff and Landings. Let's welcome Kathleen Vasconcelos. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Welcome to the AOPA Air Safety Foundation presentation of Mastering Takeoffs and Landings. Before we get started on our featured topic, I just want to touch briefly on a program that AOPA has called the Airport Support Network. This is a network of volunteers that serve as the eyes and ears at our nation's airports. Um, if you have an airport locally that doesn't have a volunteer, we would love to have you sign up or sign up someone you know. Uh, you can go to aopa.org slash ASN, or you can look at this list we have here. These are some local airports in need of volunteers, and we would love to have you participate in this program. Now let's look at why we're here a brief demonstration of why we need to talk about takeoffs and landings. So maybe now we all feel better about some of our own landings, right? <laughs> uh, this presentation is very video heavy. I think the best way to learn about takeoffs and landings is actually to see them. So there's a lot of demonstration, a lot of video, um, similar to when you go to your local airport and watch takeoffs and landings. That's a great way to learn. So you will see a lot of videos to demonstrate what we talk about. I did also want to let you all know that uh, here in the back on the table we have a, a brochure that highlights some of the things we'll talk about, so please take one on your way out. There's also a registration form um, for attendance here. And for anyone watching from home, if you go to asf.org, we do have our brochure online as well. So why do we have all this trouble? It, it sounds pretty basic, right? We take off and we land on every flight. We practice a lot, especially as students, but there are some trouble spots. We have talked about this before. The Air Safety Foundation did a seminar a few years ago called Ups and Downs on this same topic of takeoffs and landings. Since then, the statistics actually haven't changed too much. As you can see, from 2002 to 2006, it's really remained pretty steady, upper 500s, lower 600s, and even into 2007, there were 574 takeoff and landing accidents. So it continues to be a trouble spot for pilots, and that's why we've brought the seminar back, we've updated it, and we're talking about it again today. Nobody ever collided with the sky, as far as I know, uh, but when we talk about flying close to the pavement, we're talking about close to the ground, at the edge of the aircraft's performance envelope with ever-changing conditions and environment. Our airplanes are relatively fragile. 
and we're using skills that erode over time. I'll admit, as a student, I spent probably too many practice sessions only in the pattern because it's something that you practice a lot as a student. But over time, you may do just one takeoff and one landing, hopefully, on every flight. So those skills do erode, and um, it is all about practice. There's both art and science to takeoffs and landings. We can't always just do it by the book. It isn't black and white. There's a lot of judgment, and preparation and studies certainly help. You can actually compare it to learning a foreign language. It's good to study, it's good to practice, um, but just over time, you get a feel for it. So preparation and study is wonderful. It's how we learn, but it's all about keeping that up. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, what goes up must come down again. We like to say what comes down must be able to go back up again. <laughs> and it helps if you can do that without the help of a crane. This was a gear up accident and um, the bottom line really is to do this safely without an accident. So let's jump right into takeoffs. This is one thing that some pilots suffer from, hyperapplicatus tobrachitis. It's a condition resulting from high foot placement on the rudder pedals. Symptoms include inadvertent brake actuation, extended takeoff roll, loss of directional control. Have any of you had students with clown shoe syndrome? Or maybe you yourself have clown shoe syndrome. So that's one thing that we'll talk about today. I don't know if anyone has ever been in an airplane taking off and the passengers or co-pilot says that was a really nice takeoff. You don't hear it very often, right? Even if it was a good takeoff. Um, but still, there are some real issues, even though we um, tend to just take it for granted that it's a simple act. Um, it's clearly not when you look at the statistics. You're at a high angle of attack with a low airspeed, but increasing airspeed and energy, increasing altitude and high engine stress. So that sometimes is a recipe for disaster. In fact, takeoffs are 10 times deadlier than landings. These are 2006 statistics. The trends don't change a whole lot. Uh, in 2006, there were 2% of the um, accidents in landings were fatal versus 20% in takeoffs. So it's worth a discussion. We'll look at some of the basic techniques and some trouble spots that pilots encounter when they're taking off. It's a good idea before every takeoff to run through some mental preparation and a, a pre-flight briefing to yourself or even out loud before every flight when I'm holding short at the end of the runway. I actually verbalize, um, sometimes I'm talking to myself, but um, I always verbalize what I'll do on a normal takeoff and what I'll do if the unexpected happens. So you are prepared and you don't have to think about it if an emergency occurs and you're already ready for it. So mentally prepare for that, um, even if you're just in your mind thinking about it. If you're with another pilot, I find that it helps to say it out loud because maybe they have some ideas too. And you can also talk about splitting the duties of flying the plane versus the radio calls. And it's all mapped out and you're all ready before you even take, do the takeoff roll. Under normal conditions, a takeoff should be a smooth, gradual transition to flight. You don't want to hold the aircraft on the runway too long and you also don't want to pull it off the runway. So let's look at an example of what a normal takeoff should look like. See, we should all say, nice takeoff. We should get in the habit of saying that. <laughs> things to look for. There are some things that happen on takeoff that sound really simple. And they can just be minor distractions, but if they get out of hand, they can lead to big problems. Things like door latches, it should be just a distraction, um, but when you actually are in flight and, and you don't abort on the ground, that can lead to problems. Control locks still being in place. Trees and buildings know not only what's at the end of the runway, but what's around the runway that can create turbulence, crosswinds, and um, problems like that on takeoff. Foot placement, we talked briefly about clown shoe syndrome. Um, knowing where your feet are on the pedals versus the brakes. And then the wind, loss of directional control because of winds and gussy conditions. So let's talk about that. That's a, a major trouble spot. We've seen accidents occur um, mostly because of loss of directional control in crosswind conditions. Make sure when you're taking off in a crosswind, the ailerons are into the wind. You roll them out gradually 
use rudder inputs and hold that aircraft off the ground until you have positive and you want positive liftoff. When I was learning, when I was a student, I would always ask my instructors, how much aileron, how much rudder? And the answer always was, as much as it takes. There's no formula for that. It depends on um, what the conditions are, and it's good to be aggressive with that and um, control the aircraft before it gets out of control. Other things to watch for, terrain and tall grass, these are all going to impact how the aircraft takes off by slowing the aircraft, grabbing at the tires, and you'll need a longer roll. A rough surface is going to try to bounce the aircraft early, and you want to um, make sure that it doesn't bounce off too early, but you also don't want to hold the aircraft on the ground too long, which could result in a prop damage. IMC on dark nights. This causes problems with VFR pilots, especially if it's a dark, moonless night, and all of a sudden, after takeoff, you have to go on the gauges. Then that has caused some accidents as well. Density altitude. This is a factor not just in mountainous areas. Um, on a hot, humid day, density altitude is, um, has a large impact on takeoff, and it's something to be aware of during your pre-flight briefing when you check the conditions. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. Here's a video of what appears to be a normal takeoff. Let's look at what happens. So far, so good? Let's look at the rest of the story. There were four adult occupants of this aircraft, along with 271 pounds of baggage, 60 gallons of fuel. Oh, and the temperature was 107 degrees that day. Let's look at the rest of that takeoff. There just happened to be, you can see the courtesy of a news station, there just happened to be a news crew at the airport that day shooting some B-roll for a, an airport story they were doing and they caught that on tape. The 60 gallons of fuel was found at the accident site, so um, that was in the aircraft. How much already spilled out, we don't know. There could have been more. Um, the 107 degree temperature, that was the temperature in the community that day. So over the hot asphalt, probably much higher than that. Two people died in that accident, um, two survived. So when we talk about takeoffs, having um, fatalities and consequences, that is uh, quite a graphic depiction of what can happen. Let's talk briefly about the go or no-go decision. This should be, again, part of that pre-flight takeoff briefing that you do. Under what conditions will you not go? Will you abort? Is the, as you're rolling, will, is the engine throttling up smoothly? producing full power? Is the aircraft accelerating normally? If anything is abnormal, the sooner you abort, the better. Here's a rule of thumb. I'm sorry, maybe you thought there would be no math today, but um, a little bit of math, I'll help you through it. Um, a rule of thumb, if you're not at half the stall speed by one quarter of the runway, it's a good idea to abort. So for example, if your aircraft stalls at 50, you would want to be at 25 knots by the 1,000 foot, for example, of a 4,000 foot runway. Um, that means everything's accelerating normally and you're in good shape. If that's not happening, abort. Also, don't waste runway. Sometimes when we're taxiing onto the runway, we kind of make a wide arcing turn. It's best to use as much of the runway as possible and start right as, at the end as depicted in the illustration. So the abort window. If you take a look at the airspeed at which you abort, there's a very, very large difference in um, the amount of runway. If you abort at 30 knots, it's only 250 feet. If you stop while you're at 60 knots, you need 1,000 feet. So you can see that can lead to problems, especially if you're at a short field. Obviously, many more reasons to abort early, and that's why that rule of thumb is, is a good rule to follow. Examples such as distractions, like we talked about in open door, not a big deal, right? 
But the sooner you abort, the better, because if you wait, it could be a big deal if you go off the end of the runway, for example. Uh, cockpit smoke, not a big deal if you're still on the runway, but it's a symptom of a much larger problem, and you don't want to have to deal with that um, up in the air if you can avoid it. Shorts and soft field. With a short field, you want to use flaps, go to the very end of the runway, apply full power, and then release your brakes. And uh, after liftoff, you'll be climbing out at VX for a short field. Let's take a look at one example of that. And now a brief discussion on soft fields. You want to roll right onto the runway without stopping, keep that nose high, fly into ground effect, and then ease the pressure off. Here's an example of a soft field takeoff. Was that a good soft field takeoff? Did anyone notice what was wrong with it? He's, he was stopped at the end of the runway. So if it were a true soft field takeoff, you would want to keep rolling and not, that was more um, of a short field, stopping at the end of the runway and holding the brakes. So not the best example in that regard. So when we talk about short field, uh, here's, sorry, more math. Uh, here's another uh, rule of thumb to use for a short field, a 50-50 solution. And that just means add 50% to the distance in your POH for takeoff over a 50-foot obstacle. So for example, if your POH says you need 1,200 feet, add 600 to it, and your new runway minimum is 1,800. If you use that rule of thumb and you already know beforehand, then there's no question um, when you look at the runway length. You already know you need at least 1,800 feet. Also remember that you probably won't, in fact you won't, make book numbers. Um, even if your aircraft is new, uh, I don't know if we have any test pilots here, but the POH numbers are, as we know, based on a new aircraft flown by a test pilot. So um, it's good to add that safety margin to those numbers. Time to talk about landings. Something else that some pilots suffer from Spasticus short finalitis. This is characterized by rapid erratic control movements during approach and landing. And if a CFI is present, you'll often hear, take over, or your airplane. It is wonderful when we can do beautiful landings and impress all of our passengers, especially if there's another pilot on board, right? That's when you want to do your best landing. But really, it's not a beauty contest. Don't overthink it. Again, just like with takeoffs, you want to do it safely. That's the, that's the number one thing. And it sounds funny, but it's true. The bad ones are usually, they feel a lot worse than they look. So anyone watching, they might not think it's that bad, even though it feels really bad in the airplane. Our basic goals on landing are to get from the traffic pattern, transition to the ground in a small, smooth, controlled manner, without touching the edges of the aerodynamic envelope, and we want to use a reasonable amount of runway. The greaser that we all strive for, where you can't even feel the wheels touch down, that's what we all want, right? It's not always the best thing to do. Sometimes you just need the airplane down on the ground and planted, so it won't bounce, it won't take off again, you just need it down. High winds, turbulence, crosswinds, and even short fields, these are examples of sometimes where you just need the airplane down and it doesn't have to be beautiful or smooth. You just don't want to harm the airplane. No accidents and safety. Those are our goals. Here's an airline example of this. <laughs> 
So the airplane, that was obviously a very firm touchdown, but it was safe. They made it down, and that's what is good in some conditions. There's more than one way to land an airplane, obviously. There may be as many techniques as there are pilots in the room right now, but there are some basic things that are necessary for all successful landings. So I'm not here to change your technique or um, change the way you land, um, do what works for you, but there are some common things that we must do on all landings, and we'll talk about those things. The necessities. Horizontal vertical and longitudinal alignment and airspeed control. These are the things that are common for all landings. If those four things, if you don't have those four things, that's when we have problems and that's when accidents can occur. So we'll look at those four topics today. Now you'll have to think back to a bad landing. I know it might have been a long time ago. We don't want to admit, but just admit to yourself that you've had a bad landing. Um, think back to it, and when did that chain start? The chain of events that led to a bad landing or a problem. It probably didn't start during the flare. It probably started much before that. A bad landing can result in misjudged descent from crews, even a last minute ATC request, something non-standard and unexpected can lead to problems on landing. Unfamiliar field not knowing the airport and the um, environment around it. Traffic issues, again, things that are non-standard, and abnormal or unexpected weather. All of these things, as far back as crews, can affect the landing. So it's a good idea during the approach to have the airplane collected, or to have those four things that we talked about all aligned and all set up properly, within range and stable. But at what point should you really be stable? As a general rule, 300 to 400 feet above the runway is a good time to have everything stabilized. And so all you have to concentrate on is finishing that final approach and going into the flare transition. This will vary with pilots and circumstances, um, depending on the experience level of the pilot, depending on what you're flying, how comfortable you are, your currency, um, and the circumstances such as the environment, the field, and the weather. So have your own policy. This is something you should think about beforehand. And if you're not at that stabilized approach by that time frame that you've already set for yourself, it's a good idea to go around and get set up again so you'll do a proper landing. The runway shape will change on final approach depending on if you're high, too low, or on a normal glide path approach to the runway. These shapes, and that's what it looks like. It's a good thing for student pilots to study this because this is something that as you fly and do more practice, you really just get a feel for this and um, a feel for how the airplane is reacting on final and whether it, you're high or low or right on. So um, the shapes are something to have in the back of your mind, but the more you fly, the more comfortable you'll get with this. The aiming point, it's a good idea to look at a point in the windscreen, match it up with your aiming point, and where that point moves, or whether it moves, will determine whether you're gaining altitude, decreasing, or if you're right on target. If that spot is moving up, that means that you're getting lower. If it moves down, then you're getting higher. And if it stays right at that same place in the windscreen, then you're right on your aiming point. Let's look at an example of each of those three. Here's an example of the spot on the windscreen moving up. The bar is aligned with the aiming points, but you can see how it's changing. Here's an example where that spot in the windscreen is moving down so the airplane is getting higher. In this example, the bar is lined up with the aiming point and it's not moving. It remains right on the aiming points. This is a great approach. <laughs> 
I would recommend not putting a piece of duct tape on the windscreen to mark your line. So the planes I fly, I can usually find a bug to line up with the aiming point, but whatever works, whatever point, um, just don't put a bar on your windscreen. Forward slips. This is a great tool to have in your toolkit. Sometimes um, when we're learning how to fly, we think, oh, I can't slip because I just need a little bit of adjustment. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be a major adjustment to use a slip. Just know how to transition in and out of them gradually, smoothly, and successfully. Here's one example of a, f a successful forward slip. So just something to kind of carry in your back pocket and have in your toolkit, just in case. Airspeed. Energy management is so important on landing that it's one of those four things we talked about. So it's clearly not the only thing you have to worry about on landing, but it just may be the most important. Airspeed is energy, and landing is all about managing that energy. Have it, if you have excess or insufficient energy, that's when you'll have some problems. You can see that even just a slight change in the airspeed will, will give you problems, even a few extra knots will give you a lot more distance and you'll float down the runway and we'll see some examples of that as well. So managing the, ener uh, the energy or the airspeed is really key. Goldilocks. We don't want the porridge too hot or too cold. We want it just right. So we'll use the Goldilocks principle when we talk about landing. We don't want too cold. We don't want to get too slow stall the aircraft, that's bad news. We don't want too hot and, and float down the runway. Again, even, oh, this is even worse with short field conditions. We want it just right. Speaking of too hot, let's take a look at this video. I was able to get a drink of water during that one. So you can see how long they, they floated down the runway. And um, be careful, you never know where the Air Safety Foundation camera crew will be. Just hang out at these airfields and get, get fodder for our next seminar. Another trouble spot is the flare. And I will admit, since I'm telling stories on myself, that my solo t-shirt does have a little note from my instructor that I was uh, Miss No Flare. So um, I'm painfully familiar with these problems. The three-point landing um, is a problem when there's no flare. Let's take a look at that. We'll see it in slow-mo here. three-point landing. The drop-in happens when you flare too high, you fl flare a few feet above where you should, and then it just falls from there. Let's take a look at that. You flare that high, the airplane's done flying, the wings are done flying, and it just drops in. Another example is a bounce that can occur after a flat landing. So if it doesn't land flat and then roll out, you can bounce. And again, not good for the aircraft. Not good for the pilot ego either, I, I guess. And the last one is the float, which we saw demonstrated. Here's a side-by-side -side with the uh, a normal landing and then a float. 
Okay, so there's just four examples of having trouble with the flare. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about airspeed control and having excess or insufficient airspeed. If the wing is not done flying yet, there's excess energy, you're going to float. It's going to keep flying until it's good and ready to land. Uh, if it was done flying a few feet, five feet above the runway, then it's done flying and it's going to come down. So managing that energy again um, is really important. And let's look at a couple examples of this. Here's an example of too much energy, too much airspeed. And then one that had insufficient energy or airspeed. Here's an example of that. Ouch. Okay. Pitch control. Judging pitch, using depth perception to judge your height above the runway is really important. And it can, re and it, being able to judge properly makes a difference between a good landing and a bad landing as far as the flare is concerned. Here's a look at a normal flare. and then no flare at all in this example. I think what finally helped me, um, since I told you I've had some problems with this, um, what finally helped me was really getting a feel for looking down the runway. It's very easy to, we're looking at that aiming point, right? To keep looking at the aiming point. But as you transition from the approach to the flare, you really need to shift your gaze down the end of the runway. And here's um, an illustration of how to do that. It really helps you judge the height above the runway and how to transition into the flare. So you're looking where you want to land on approach. And right before, you, as you transition to the flare, change your gaze to the end of the runway and it really helps you know when to start that flare. Briefly leveling out the aircraft is another one of those things to have in your toolkit. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to have in case you need it. Um, it's okay not to go straight from approach to flare. You can briefly level out, kind of get a feel for what the airplane is going to do. So much of this is getting a feel for it and being familiar with your airplane and its characteristics. So um, it's okay to do that. It sometimes helps with ballooning and to avoid ballooning. Also, some students have what we call ground shyness, where they're aiming at the runway on approach and they, they're afraid that they're going to actually crash into the runway. This helps with it. <coughs> Approaching, aiming to the runway, they're briefly leveling out and transitioning to the flare. That tends to help students um, to um, avoid that ground shyness as well. Failure to flare has um, can damage a pilot's ego, but let's look at what it does to the airplane. The nose wheel, think of it as steering gear, not landing gear. You want to land on the main gear because the firewall and the nose wheel of most airplanes are not designed to handle the large amounts of stress that can happen when you don't flare. And we have another video. That kind of situation, when it's a really flat landing, it really stresses the aircraft, so it's, it's not good for that. Everyone in here flies all, just a variety of different airplanes, so I'm really not going to get too much into what each type of airplane, their characteristics, because we just don't have uh, the time to do that. But it's something to be aware of and to know about the airplanes that you usually fly. The wing design, whether it's high or low loading, and how it stalls the characteristics, that can affect the landing. High and low wing aircraft, that's going to affect the landing as well and whether the airframe is clean. As well as 
control forces. Some airplanes, if you've flown um, a few different airplanes, some of them are really heavy and um, the control forces as you land, sometimes you need both hands, that's okay. Just know what it takes for that airplane and for you. The landing gear, get a feel for how it reacts on landing. And also the CG of your aircraft, whether your nose heavy or you have an aft CG, these are all things that um, in that situation will change on each flight. So this should be part as well as that pre-flight briefing. Just like your takeoff briefing, you should do a pre-landing briefing and be familiar. So if you're high on final, you pitch down to correct for that altitude, you're gonna build up airspeed, right? Excess energy will result from that, as we talked about, this is energy management. If you add to that an impatient pilot, we might have some problems. Let's look at an example of that. A lot of the things that we've talked about so far with takeoffs and landings are all about how the wing flies and the aerodynamics involved. The Air Safety Foundation does have an aerodynamics course on our website, asf.org slash aerodynamics. I promise you it's not your college level aerodynamics course. Uh, we actually make aerodynamics fun. You have to see it to believe it. It can be done. Um, we do have many other courses on our website, but this is a really good one as you're studying um, mastering takeoffs and landings. So I hope you'll all check that out on our website. Oops. Let's look at um, a pilot perspective on landings from Mr. Rod Machado. Minutes to go around and make a complete circuit in the traffic pattern. The actual act of landing flare, which is the difficult part, takes place in about the last 15 seconds. The problem is this. In the last 15 seconds, the most critical part of the landing, for most people, that happens very quickly. Airspeed bleeds off very quickly. An airplane is, um, uh, settles very quickly. It's hard to anticipate ground closure. So what you need is a time machine. And the best time machine to have is right there on the panel. It's called the throttle. And when you come down to flare, you do the round out. Typically, you bring your power all the way back. I'm suggesting, as long as you have, have a long enough runway now, and this is the key, add a little bit of power, just a little bit, to create smooth airflow over the horizontal stabilizer. And how much power that is, it, it really typically varies with uh, the aircraft, but maybe an extra 200 uh, RPM, maybe an extra two inches of manifold pressure, something like that. What that does is it minimizes your ground closure rate and allows you to anticipate exactly how you should start the round out and the flare, and thereby giving you a much better chance of making a smoother landing. Now, there are a lot of ways to make smooth landings, but in terms of the best technique that you have where one size fits all, that's what I would recommend. I would also say that for any students in the room or even private pilots that are having problems judging when to flare, maybe something Rod said helped more than something I said. I think it's a good idea to fly with a different flight instructor because if they might say something different that really helps you, your CFI shouldn't get offended by that. It's a good idea to get a different perspective. Then go back with your other instructor and use that information to improve your landings. Again, talking about the wear and tear on your aircraft because of some of these issues, stomping on the brakes is not a good idea. It can have some serious um, effect on the aircraft as illustrated in um, the tire photo here. Watch your foot position. Make sure that you're only on the brakes if you want to be on the brakes and that you're not inadvertently um, braking excessively. Again, airspeed control will help with this and you won't have that need. Let's look at an example of excessive braking. That's not necessary, and if you are managing the airspeed correctly, then you shouldn't have to do that. So just something, again, to be um, aware of. 
crosswinds, since this is something that causes a lot of problems, directional control and loss of, of directional control, this is something worth discussing in depth. Do we have military or former military pilots in here? If you're on a Navy ship, hey, no problem with the crosswind. Turn the ship into the crosswind. If you're in the Air Force, just turn the landing gear. The B-52, you don't want to land it in a crab, right? The wings are a little low, so you use the crosswind landing gear and land in a crab. Here's an example. That would be fantastic to have on the Archer I fly, but it hasn't happened yet. So uh, for the rest of us, we just have to cope with crosswind, and that comes into training and practicing. Remember that as the pilot in command, you're the boss. How much correction does it take? As much as it takes. There's no black and white rule. Don't be timid. Be aggressive on the controls so you're properly correcting for that wind. And also, um, use enough rudder availability as much as you need. But how much rudder is available? You don't want to exceed what the aircraft can handle. So um, it may not be illegal to land in more than the maximum demonstrated crosswind that's in the POH. Uh, the aircraft can probably handle it, but I would really question a pilot's judgment if you do that. Uh, you'll be in test pilot mode in that case, and it's really not a good idea. You have to have your own basic personal minimums and limitations as well as those of your aircraft and they work hand in hand. You may hear some pilots say, oh, I landed in a 25 knot wind. Sometimes you'll hear that, but that's probably the total wind and not just the crosswind component. If you're landing in, if you're uh, doing the math again and landing in just a certain crosswind component, it's a, a very good idea to stay within the POH numbers and not exceed the maximum demonstrated. So crosswind technique, landing in a crosswind, hold the aileron into the wind and the rudder to point the aircraft towards the nose towards the runway and touch down with the upwind main landing gear first, then the downwind, and then the nose should be last. Here's another video to demonstrate this. Some crosswind issues that you might run into, um, use the minimum flaps needed for the runway length. Remember that the uh, flaps will extend the surface area and that's just more surface area of the wing for the wind to push against. So use the minimum needed. Above that, as we talked about, above the max demonstrated crosswind, you're the test pilot. In a very windy situation, you probably don't want to be the test pilot, so um, use your best judgment. And short field, take into account how long the, the runway itself is. Uh, we talked about minimum flaps in a crosswind situation, but if you're landing on a short field, you want to use full flaps. If you're debating whether you want to use minimum flaps for the wind or maximum flaps for the runway length, it's probably time to find a new runway. That's probably the safest choice, is just to go somewhere else in that situation. I don't think we want to get into a debate about crab versus slip. We don't really have the time here and it, it might get kind of wild. So uh, everyone has a preference. I would just say do what works for you. Everyone's personal preference is fine. Um, take into account the time you'll need to adjust and do that transition versus also your passenger comfort. What's best for those on board your airplane. Just do what works for you and transition at some point. So uh, loss of directional control causes many problems in crosswind situations. We have to really be on top of it and know how much to correct for. As the airspeed drops, you'll need more control input and you'll need to maintain that after touchdown. 
When you're on approach and or before approach and you've checked ATIS or AWAS and you get the wins and you do a win check, you'll have in your mind a certain win that you'll be correcting for. But that may change and the wind may most likely will get a little less as you're closer to the ground. So fly the wind that actually exists, not what you have in your mind that should be there. Really understand the wind that is there. So let's look at um, another video talking about needing more control input. In this case, there just wasn't enough correction on the approach and the aircraft got blown in the crosswind. And here's an example of not maintaining that correction after landing. If it's a really windy day, and you have your controls in, your aileron, your rudder, and you're so happy, you're maintaining center line, it feels so great, and then you touch down and you're, oh, I made it. That's what can happen. You have to keep the controls in or you're actually, when you're on the runway, you could get blown to the side because the wind is still there even though you're on the runway and you've made it. Turbulence, this is another trouble spot. As you approach the runway, if it's a warm day, that rising hot air over the hot pavement can add burble, which I don't think that's the technical term, but it can add a burble to your approach and this is uh, what it can look like. Right as they approach the hot air over the runway, there's a little bit of rise there. So be aware that that might happen if you're flying in those conditions. That also adds to ground effect. The opposite can happen if there's cool creeks and rivers. The aircraft could have some sink on approach. So be familiar with the airport that you're approaching. A lot of locals, they really know what to expect in these quirks at their own airport. If you're at an unfamiliar field, just be aware before you go what the environment is so you can be prepared for these things. Same with terrain and obstructions. Um, all of this, you just have to know what's around the airport because it can all influence your landing. And if you need to, be ready to go around. Here's a great example of maybe you should have gone around. This was um, someone, a pilot that we knew actually, we were shooting some other video and um, he was pretty shaken up by that. As you can see, um, it, when we talk about it, it felt worse in the airplane than it looks. It looks bad enough, right? And it probably felt even worse. So maybe in that case, it would be best to just go around. In short field, it's really important to uh, maintain that aiming point on the windscreen Use um, just enough airspeed to transition properly to the flare, but you don't want excess and positive firm touchdown on a short field. Okay, I've done a lot of talking. Does anyone else want to volunteer? Does anyone have a landing tip that you'd like to share? And I'll add, you don't have to be a CFI to have a good landing tip. Some shy pilots here today? Yes. Yes. In a light aircraft, like a Cessna, you want to stall the plane onto the runway. But in a heavier aircraft, without holding excess energy, you yeah. mean? Just holding enough excess airspeed so you're transitioning to the flare without stalling it. So again, that's uh, um, something that would be to fly it all the way into the flare and then cutting full power. And that's, that goes back to the airplane characteristics of your specific airplane. But yeah, there is definitely a difference. Mm -hmm.
right that can all always make a that, that makes a difference Absolutely. but just to simply stall the plane right onto the runway and it makes for a smooth landing instead of forcing it on right it's and the more and the more you fly that airplane the more you get used to that the more you get used to it right right yeah exactly. it's hard to transition to something different that's true yeah, yeah. okay good point um, we're down to about 10 minutes so I'm going to move along on a few more slides um, and there'll be more opportunity for question at the end I want to add so runway conditions can impact the landing as well grass will be slicker and will affect braking. You'll have to, um, there'll be reduced braking on grass and if the grass has dew or frost on it, then it will even add more to the slickness. A rough surface will bounce the aircraft, so there'll be less effectiveness on the braking because there's not that, that constant um, impact on the surface. So be aware that it will take longer to roll out in that situation. Same with uh, standing water on the runway and hydroplaning and again, reduced braking action. Go around, we looked at that landing where it really should have been a go around. Some pilots don't like to admit defeat. Um, in other cases, you just haven't practiced go arounds in a while, you might not be comfortable with them. It's a good idea to mentally prepare yourself under what conditions will you go around. Then you're not having that internal debate as you're approaching. You're already ready to go around. The longer you wait, the worse it's going to be. The caveat here is if you've already made it to the runway, as with that, that uh, landing we saw, if it was a really rough approach and you made it, stay down. It's just going to be worse if you try to go around again. Um, some go around mistakes we've, we've touched on. This was an accident that was um, a classic landing accident a few years ago in Mountain Air Airport in North Carolina. The pilot came in high and fast bounced on the runway, bounced again a few hundred feet down the runway. As you can see, the runway's at the top of a mountain and it's only 2,800, 2,900 feet long by 50 feet. It veered off the runway, crashed into some parked cars and there were three fatalities. So again, a really unfortunate graphic depiction of what can happen when um, a bad landing turns into an accident. Okay, so enough of the doom and gloom. What happens when it's right, when it all comes together? Airspeed's on target, good pitch attitude, good gradual transition. Let's look at two examples of when it goes right. And one more. So that's when all those four things are all um, collected at the beginning of the approach and a smooth transition, short rollout, and um, you'll impress your passengers and the aircraft will love you too. So to wrap up, a few things on landing. Alignment horizontally, vertically, and longitudinally. And airspeed control, the most important thing of those four. Know what you can handle today. Know what you can handle at that point. The environment, your currency, your comfort with the aircraft you're flying. Don't think about what you used to do. It doesn't matter. What just matters is what can you do that one day. Don't let the airplane control you. You're in control. If there's a crosswind, don't let the aircraft be blown off the center line. Put in enough aggressive control to maintain the aircraft. And if you're thinking about going around, if that even crosses your mind, you should probably go around. Don't have an internal debate. You go with your gut instinct and it's probably right. It's always better than waiting too long. And now, what you've all been waiting for, the secret to making those perfect landings from Mr. Barry Sheff. Let's hear what he has to say about I, it. I don't know. I, I've been asked many times how to make the perfect landing and I don't think there is a secret to it. I think that it happens and when it does you're grateful and thankful that it does and a lot of it has to do with what you feel in your fingertips what you feel through the, uh, the seat of your pants I've made uh, approaches to landings I thought were gonna wind up in devastation and the airplane squeaked on the ground and I never felt it on the other hand I've done everything perfectly and crunched the airplane on the ground in a most embarrassing way 
I don't think there are secrets except to say it takes a great deal of practice to achieve a level of suitable satisfaction, something you're happy with all the time. The perfect landing is an accident. It's a freak. Okay, so there's no secret. It's an accident, it just happened, but it's still good to practice, um, obviously, to make better landings. Um, I thank you all for coming. Uh, the Air Safety Foundation has, we talked about air, the aerodynamics course, we have many other online interactive courses free of charge for all pilots on our website, asf.org. Other um, articles and safety publications are there as well. And we're also over in AOPA's tent, and we encourage you all to stop by and, and chat with us today. So. Thank you very much for coming. I'm available for questions that you might have. We do have a, a few more minutes, so um, if anyone has any questions. Yes? I noticed the slide said you flap for a short field takeoff, but not all pilot operating handbooks call for flaps on short field takeoffs. That's a great point. This is more a general rule, but that's a great point is to um, get some transition training when you're uh, going to a new aircraft, if you're familiar with flying short fields and soft fields a certain way, that's a great point that not all aircraft will require the same procedures. Thank you. Great, thank you all very much. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Stay right here. Okay. Well, that was pretty interesting. All that time that we've spent practicing takeoff and landings, <laughs> I did notice one thing. Yes. You said that flaps should be used as appropriate. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that I see having trouble with landings, they're always in the full flap position. Okay. And when I ask them, why are you landing full flap on every landing? You know, I get an interesting answer. Well, that's what the airlines do. <laughs> well, they're different kind of airplanes. Good point. So that's we true. need to fly the airplane that we've got, not somebody else's. Absolutely. And for the conditions, that's right. So. Now that the Air Safety Foundation has made this presentation on takeoff and landings, do you think we'll be able to apply any of that on our next flight? Absolutely. I hope so. I hope everyone takes away at least a little nugget of information to apply. Yes, absolutely. I know a few things I won't do on the next one. <laughs> and we'll try not to have a video camera there when you do those mistakes. <laughs> any other questions? Well, we've got another show coming up here at 1130, and it's John and Martha King, and they'll be talking about operational risk management, not just the theory of it. So please come back and join us for John and Martha King.